So before we get to the lesson, I will give anybody in the room 100% final mark in this course. You know what? I'll give everybody in the room 100% final mark in this course if one of you does the following for me. I will. It's, it's a legal promise. I'm not kidding. You can all walk out of this room with $100 if on October 1st you give me a penny. Okay. And on the 2nd, you give me two pennies. And on the 3rd, you don't give me three, you give me four pennies. And on the next day, you give me eight. So you see that the amount of money is doubling, right? There's no way I would make this deal to you if the amount of money went up by a penny each day. Because you could you might have that cash in your pocket right now. On the fifth day, you double it, 16 cents. And this continues up to Halloween, up to and including Halloween. Now, why am I confident in this bet? Because nobody has that much money. And if you do have that much money, I would gladly take it off your hands, retire very nicely from teaching, buy my dream yacht and sail the islands and live a tropical life because the amount of money that we're talking about here is staggering and there's a difference between what we have been talking about which is to take a number and add something to it and continue to add that same amount those things go up linearly now let's explore what we're talking about here so I'm going to take my calculator and I might, as well, I might as well put it in dollars, okay? I could say just one. But this is what you give me on the first day, right? And if I multiply that by two, this is what I get on the second day. And I think, I think if I just hit equals, it will continue to double. So this is the third day. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth big whoopee deal on the 10th day you're going to give me five dollars and 12 cents now keep in mind i've also got 256 and a dollar 28 and all that it's cumulative this is just how much you get i get from you on the 10th day let's continue 11 12 13 14 15 well now it's getting interesting on the 15th day just on the 15th day you Collectively, you have to come up with 163.84. I said 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. On the 20th day, just on that day, never mind all the other days together, you have to come up with $5,242.88. And now you start to go, well, maybe I'm not going to be able to do this. Because you still have all those other days too, right? But that's 20. That's 20, correct? 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. On the 25th day alone, you would have to give me $167,772. 26, 27, 28, 29. The day before the last day, on the 30th day, that's $5 million. That's... Five million three hundred and sixty eight thousand seven hundred and nine dollars and I would want it all and twelve cents. We had an agreement, I want that twelve cents. So think about this for a second. That means on Halloween, on Halloween alone, we're talking about close to eleven million dollars. And this type of progression, we call it exponential in how many of you have heard the word exponential? We have, some of you have. If you haven't, you have now. This is what we would call exponential in math 30-1, but we can call it geometric at this level. So when you start talking about the difference in comparison between something that is arithmetic and something that is geometric... Arithmetic 
looks like that. It goes up linearly because each increase in n, you have that common difference being added on. Geometric might start off slow, but it takes off. Now there's more details to that graph, but I just want to give you a general visual here that if this were n and this were a term value, this is what arithmetic looks like. And we've seen this before. What we're talking about today is if this is a term and this is n, this is what geometric would look like. And I can you know, reveal the definition to geometric now, even though I haven't looked at it in your notes. What's happening with arithmetic is you're adding something regularly. What's happening with this geometric is we're multiplying by something regularly. In this illustration here, what we were doing is multiplying the previous day or the previous amount or the previous term by 2 regularly, times 2, times 2, times 2, not plus 5, plus 5, plus 5, or something like that. So this is what we're talking about today. Today, we're going to be looking at geometric sequences. This is on, thank you, page 14 of your unit handout. We're going to identify geometric sequences, work with something called a common ratio. A common ratio is the cousin of a common difference. You know, there's a common thing happening with arithmetic called the common difference. The thing that's common for geometric is called a common ratio. We were writing general terms for arithmetic sequences. We're going to be doing that for geometric, and we're going to be finding values of geometric terms. So a geometric sequence is one in which every term after the first term is found by multiplying the previous term by some constant. So if we, for example, consider the following sequence, 3, 6, 12, 24, there's not a common difference because to go from 3 to 6, you add 3. But if I add 3 to 6, it doesn't take me to 12. It takes me to 9. But what we can notice here is that if I double 3, I get 6. If I double 6, I get 12, etc. So the first term is equal to 3. And to get the next term, you multiply by 2. To get the next term, you multiply by 2. I mean, we keep doing this. 3 times 2 is 6, times 2 is 12. And this continues on and on and on. Do you get my drift here? Okay, so we can write this off on the side. I think yours is formatted a little differently. It might be written horizontally, but T1 is given to you. T1 is 3. What is T2? It is T1 times 2. What is T3? It's T2 times 2. What is T4? It's T3 times 4. I want you to notice something, though, and, and I want you to really think carefully and try to draw a connection between what you've seen with arithmetic and what I'm about to tell you. That if I take the first term, which is 3, if I take the first term and I multiply it by this number 3 times, I get the fourth term. Just like with arithmetic, if I take the first term and add the common difference three times, I get the fourth term. Here, we're taking the first term and multiplying by this number three times. And when I multiply by two and by two and by two, which is multiplying by two three times, that's not multiplying by six. It's multiplying by eight. Because this is actually... doing that. It's not multiplying by 2 by 3. It's multiplying by 2 3 times, which is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 2 to the 3, which is 8. This number in our example is what we call the common ratio. So in an arithmetic sequence, what we add each time is a common difference. In a geometric sequence, what we multiply by each time is a common ratio. 
So the common ratio is the number that you multiply a term by to get to the next term, just like the common difference is what you add to a term to get to the next term. But there's a lot to take in here, but follow along and listen carefully. The common difference is what you add to move forward, but to calculate a common difference, you do some subtraction, don't you? You take a term and subtract the one before. So the common ratio is the number that you multiply by to move forward, but to determine the common ratio, you can take a term and divide by the number before it. So if you look at your sequence, and I don't have it up here anymore, but it goes 3, 6, 12, etc. If I take 6 divided by 3, I get 2. If I take 12 divided by 6, I get 2. If I take 24 divided by 12, I get 2. Do you, are you getting my drift here? And this continues. I could take, if this sequence goes on, and it does because I put that ellipsis there, those three dots, if I find the 100th term and divide by the 99th term, I'm going to get 2. We're going in circles here. You're going to get 2 because 2 is the number you multiply the 99th term by to get the 100th term. And what we would say in general is this, that the n plus 1th term divided by the nth term will give you 2 in our example. And all I'm saying is if you take any term, no matter how big, and you divide by the term before, you're going to get the common ratio. All right. We've learned that there's a general formula for arithmetic. And I want to go through this again with you. Just, this is not in your notes, but I want to show you how we reasoned out what the formula was for the arithmetic general term. We said... We went through a process where we said this is the first term, and to get to the second term, to get to the second term, you add one common difference, right? So we said to get to the second term, you add one common difference. And then, you know, if we go, well, how do you get to the third term? To get to the third term from the first term, you add two common differences. And, and we eventually got to the point where we understood that, for example, if I wanted to find the eighth term, I would take the first term and I would add seven common differences. Right? We, we established a pattern. And then we went, well, okay, this seven is n minus one. So any term can be found by taking the first term and adding n minus 1 common differences. That was, we developed that. That made sense to us. It's not just some obscure formula we read in a textbook. Well, what if we apply the same kind of idea to geometric? And I could just give you the formula, and that would be all well and good, but I'm here to get you to think as well. That if it's geometric, which is what this lesson is about, What do I do to the first term to get the second term? Well, the answer is I multiply by, in the most general sense, multiply by 2 in this question, but I'm going to call that the common ratio. We multiply by whatever the common ratio is, right? We multiply by the common ratio one time to get the second term. And I'm going to even write this down here that the second term is the first term multiplied by r. What is it we do to the first term to get the third term? Well, we multiply by r and we multiply by r. Fair? That the third term is the first term times r times r. So the second term is the first term times 1r. The third term is the first term times r times r. The fourth term would be the first term multiplied by r three times, wouldn't it? Okay, so the second term is the first term times r to the 1. This 1 that I've written on the r is an exponent. 
This is the second term. This is, I want to actually move it over and rewrite T2 here. This is T2. T3 is the first term multiplied by R squared. Because it says times R times R, and that's R squared. The fourth term is the first term multiplied by R cubed. So what do you notice? I hope you notice that the term number that we're finding has one fewer common ratios being multiplied. So when I find the second term, I'm multiplying the first by R to the 1. When I find the third, I'm multiplying the first term by R squared. The fourth, I'm multiplying by R cubed. In other words, everybody, and I'm about to reveal this to you, in other words, if I want to find any geometric term, a term in any geometric sequence, I will take the first term and multiply by this. I'm going to multiply by r raised to one less number than the term number I'm trying to find. Well, and that's the formula. There's also a formula for geometric sequences, and I'm giving it to you here. And I think you should understand where it comes from, which is what I just explained. Remember that in your order of operations, you always deal with exponents first. So you would always have to figure out what r to that exponent is before you multiply by the first term. That's called the general term for the sequence. So as a warm-up, write the general term t sub n for the sequence that we talked about here. Well, the first, you know what? In some ways, this is easier than arithmetic. You're going to discover this along the way, that there's less work involved usually. Because if I write t1 equals 3 and the common ratio is 2, you're with me that the common ratio is 2? My general term is t sub n. I'll write out the formula again. I don't, when I write things out, I don't typically put a multiplication sign in between there. You don't have to. You can put a dot. You can put brackets around stuff. I mean, you could do this. There's lots of ways you can write it. But the mathematical intent is the following. That t sub n, in this case, will be equal to 3. Now I do need a set of brackets. Times 2 to the n minus 1. And the reason why this is in some ways easier than arithmetic is you can't do anything with that. You can't multiply the 3 by the 2. You're not allowed to multiply the 3 by the 2. Uh, you know, I'll demonstrate to you why that's the case. Let's just imagine we had 3 times 2 to the 5 minus 1. Let's just say we were finding the fifth term. Well, 5 minus 1 is 4. 2 to the 4 is 16. And I want you... Do not necessarily grab your calculator to figure out what something like 2 to the 4 is. 2 to the 4 means 2 times itself 4 times. Well, 2 times 2 is 4. The other 2 times 2 is 4. 2 to the 4 is 4 times 4, which is 16. And, and the more you get comfortable with these common powers, is what I'll call them, like 2 to the 4, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 5, the better off you'll be. So this is 3 times 16, which I believe is, I know is 48. Okay? If you think you can multiply that 2 and the 3 together, you're telling me that we're allowed to do this. Well, 6 to the 4 is not going to give you 48. 6 to the 4 gives you a very large number, in the tens of thousands probably. And if you do want to find out what 6 to the 4 is so that you can write down an incorrect answer, you would go 6 raised to the 4. 1296. I was off. It's in the thousands, not tens of thousands. So this is our answer. See, if it was arithmetic, we would then have to multiply that d through and simplify things. But we can't. There's nothing to simplify here. 
demonstrate that the result works. So let's find using this T1. Well, it would be 3 times 2 to the 1 minus 1. And along the way, I'm teaching you some basic but important math. So what I'm doing is I'm putting in to this formula 1, and I'm finding out what I get for t. So I'm getting t1 here. Well, this becomes 3 times 2 to the 0. And you should remember, I hope, that anything to the 0 other than 0 0 to the 0 is not defined. But otherwise, anything to the 0 is 1. So you're left with 3 times 1, which is 3, and that is, in fact, the first term. How many of you understand when we apply this formula to the situation where n is 2, how many of you understand why that's equivalent to multiplying the previous term by 2? See, you've increased the exponent on 2 by 1, so you're multiplying whatever you had before by an extra 2. This exponent of 2 minus 1 is 1, so we have 3 for the second term times 2 to the 1, which is 3 times 2, which is 6. And if you want, I mean, we can dispense with all this writing and put this into our calculator. Now, if I go into my calculator and I go y equals, I'm going to be entering this formula right here. And what I'm doing is I'm saying this is y and this is x. Okay, so I'm entering that. If I put that into my calculator, I have three. I either need to put a set of brackets or go times. I'm going to go times 2 raised to. Now, I can put x minus 1 here. And because of the mode my calculator is in, I don't need brackets around the x minus 1. Okay? I hate this mode for two reasons. One, I'm not always looking at my screen, so I'm typing stuff. And if I want to add numbers now, I forget to hit the arrow to get out of that exponent. How many of you kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about? Okay. The other one, and it's worse, because it, it really happens a lot in physics where your calculations are long. When you're on your home screen and you're calculating something, let's say I'm going to uh, take the square root of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times the mass of the Earth. I'm doing a physics 20 calculation here, divided by the radius of the Earth squared. You see what's happened is stuff has bumped off the screen. I may have made a mistake in what I've typed, and it's inaccessible to me now. Okay, So the difference between these two modes is that this, when you go mode and you scroll up, it's in math print mode. Okay. On the other hand, this, which is what I prefer, is if I go mode and scroll up, it's in classic mode. And when I type stuff in this mode, I could just type forever, and the only way it'll bump off the screen is if I fill the screen and then it starts disappearing above, which never happens. You know, I could type three lines of calculations and I can see it all. The, you know, you want a downside? There's another downside if you're in 30-1, but right now the downside is when I go three times two raised to, it doesn't kick my text up there. It just shows that I'm raising whatever follows as an exponent on the base of 2. And in this case, I do need to put that. What I'm teaching you here is how to use your calculator. But if you're not using it properly, you'll get incorrect answers. What you can do now is set up your table by going second window to start at 1 and go up by 1 automatically. I think we've done this enough times that you're familiar with it. And if I go to my table, Uh, 
I went, I'm going up by 0.1, let me fix that. I want to go up by 1, and if I go to my table, I can see the sequence. If I do the same thing here, I'll see the sequence as well. So you're, this is a way to confirm it. But all of you are going to have to, um, you know, be familiar with which mode you want to be in. I really like the mode on the left, particularly for science, because when you type stuff, it goes off the screen. But the other reason, again, is if I were, if I were doing this, let's say I wanted to do this calculation, and then we'll move on. I wanted to figure out what that is. See, on this calculator here, I go 4 times 3 raised to the 7 minus 12. And that, that's, what, that's what my muscle memory tells me to do. I type that all in. If I do it here, I go 4 times 3 raised to the 7 minus 12. See, and you can see what's happened there, right? That's not what I want. So I always forget, and in physics I might have a lot of numbers I'm putting in, then I look back and go, oh, goodness, they're all in the exponent. Or then I have an exponent of an exponent, and it's just a nightmare. Anyway, any questions with that warm-up? All right. Write the general term for each sequence. So I want everybody to look at that and convince themselves that it's geometric and write down what the first term and the common ratio are. Because ultimately, all we have to do is put them into this formula. I think it's glaringly obvious that the first term is negative 10. common ratio is negative 2. Now if you have a, let's say that you have an arithmetic sequence and the common difference is negative, all that means is that the terms just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and then they become negative and then they become really negative. But if you have a common ratio that's negative, what that means is that the terms are going to oscillate between positive and negative. Because if the first term is negative and I multiply by negative 2, it will become positive. Then I multiply that positive number by negative 2, it will become negative. So two things are happening here. Things are being doubled, and they're being multiplied by negative at the same time. So how do we write this? T sub n will equal to negative 10 multiplied by this. Now, what I have written is in error, okay? I'm going to just move this over a bit. What I have written is in error. And this is such a little minor thing. It's a grade 7, 8, 9 thing. But we better get a handle on it right now. We don't want to be getting marks taken off of a high school exam because you're messing up your exponent laws. What I want you to do, the first term is negative 10. The next term is 20. The next term is negative 40. Uh, am I right? Okay. Four, four, five, six, seven. I want you to find the seventh term. And, and listen very carefully. I want you to do this on your calculator. What the seventh term will be is the first term, which is right there, right, times the common ratio to the 7 minus 1. You know what the first term is, and you know what the common ratio is. What I am asking you to do is use your calculator to find the value of the seventh term using that thing that I've written down.
by the way, when you use your calculator here, nobody's going to enter 7 minus 1. You're going to just enter 6, right? I hope. Okay. So here is a wrong answer. Negative 10 multiplied by negative 2 raised to the 6. This is wrong. Okay? 54. Okay. I'm going to write 54 here, Okay, but just bear with me. Uh, multiplied. That, thank you, Raya. And by the way, I was going to write 54, and I went, how come it's so small? What happened to the, to the money exploding? This is times. I'm not sure why I did that. Okay. I get 640, okay? Anybody else get 640? You're wrong. You're wrong. And I can prove that you're wrong because 640 is a positive number, and it's supposed to go negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. This is supposed to be negative. And let me explain to you what's happened here. With what I've entered, which is incorrect, and again, I, I hate to take up valuable time unless it's for a valuable reason. This is important. I have entered negative 10, which is a negative number, and then I've said multiplied by this. That's what I have entered. And what negative 2 to the 6 means is negative 1 times 2 to the 6. Negative 2 to the 6 doesn't mean negative 2 in brackets to the 6. If I have negative x squared, that means negative 1 times x squared. It doesn't mean negative x quantity squared. If I want this to mean negative x quantity squared, then I do that. If I truly want to raise this number to the 6, then I have to put that number in brackets. Or, if you're like me, recognize that it's raised to an even exponent. Does it make sense to you that even exponents will produce positive results? It's raised to an even exponent, which means negative 2 times itself 6 times. That will produce a positive. So if you're like me, I didn't even put the negative. But going back to my discussion here, that's why if I enter this or write, let's go back to writing it, this is wrong. This does the trick. It's not times the negative of 2 to the n minus 1. It's times negative 2 quantity to the n minus 1. When you hear we, us say quantity, we mean the thing that I just said is in brackets. So x minus 5 quantity squared means this. I'm going to repeat this. x minus 5 quantity squared means this. x minus 5 squared means that. They're different. Negative 2 to the 6 is different than negative 2 quantity to the 6. Negative 2 to the n minus 1 should be written as negative 2 quantity to the n minus 1. And that's the answer to the question. Okay. If you do want to check this now, I'm going to go ahead and put this in for y. Negative 10 brackets, negative 2 n brackets raised to bracket. I admit in my mode, I have to do a lot more typing sometimes. But you have to understand when I was taught math, I was going to say we didn't even use calculators. We used calculators, but they didn't have a screen like this. So now if I go to my table, there we go, and you can see that that seventh term is negative, and it should be. If you don't have it entered right, it would be wrong. Let's try one more. 64, 32, 16. The first term is 64. The common ratio is 1 half. 
So the general term is the first term times one half to the n minus one. And you know, the same kind of thing goes here. I, I don't want to do this. Because you're telling me now that you're raising the one to the n minus one and not the two on the bottom. You have to raise the whole thing to the n minus one. Any questions with B? All right, C, T1 is 3. The common ratio happens to be 3 as well, which means the general term is the first term times 3 to the n minus 1. Does that make sense? Does this make sense? I mean, maybe what I would like you to do is convince yourself that this works. That if you put one in, you get the first term. And you put two in, and you get the second term. Does it work? How do I know that, though? The answer is this. Who can tell me what x squared times x cubed is? It's either to the 5 or to the 6, right? It's to the 5. Because x squared means this. x cubed means this. The rule is you add the exponents if the base is the same. Well, the base is the same over here. I have 3 to the 1 times 3 to the n minus 1, so I can add those exponents. So I get 3 to the 1 plus n minus 1. Well, 1 plus n minus 1 is n, so it's 3 to the n. All right. Find the ninth term in this sequence. There's the general term. By the way, you know how we put the threes together as a single power in the last question? You can't do that here because these bases are not the same. This is a 3. That's a negative 3. It's not a common base. So all we need to do is put 9 in. t sub n equals 3 times negative 3 to the 9 minus 1. I should write t sub 3 equals 3 times negative 3 to the 8. And if I were entering this into my calculator, I would not put the negative in because I know raising it to an even exponent like 8 will make it positive anyway. But if you are going to put the negative in, you do need a set of brackets around it. I will show it both ways quickly here. I can go 3 times in brackets, negative 3 n bracket raised to the 8. And I get 19,683, or I could go 3 times 3 to the 8, because the negative's not going to matter. Or I probably would have just gone 3 to the 9, because it's 3 times 3 to the 8. Anyway, the answer is 19,683. How many of you get the sense here that this is somewhat easier than arithmetic? Because it's all because of that having to simplify arithmetic. For that reason, when we take a look at B, even though it's fractional, we should still be able to do this. Well, just a second here. I want everybody to ponder on what the common ratio is. What is it you're multiplying a term by to get the term before? 
Well, it's 5 on the top of the fraction, so you're multiplying the top of the fraction by 5. Go ahead, Sukhman. 1 over 2. 1 over 2. 1 half. Right? You take 5 thirds times 1 half, 5 times 1 over 2 times 3. You multiply that by a half. When you get the denominator of a fraction being regularly doubled, then what's happening is you're multiplying by a half. So this is in line with the conversation we've had over the past couple days. I don't care about the fractional part of it, okay? Just right now I'm trying to teach you math. So you don't have to do this on paper. We're going to take 5 divided by 3 and multiply by, in brackets, well, why don't we just put 0.5? If I'm saying who cares about the fractions, just put 0.5 raised to the 6. Capiche that it's raised to the 6? Because it's n equals 7. I haven't lost you guys, have I? You're just all sitting in anticipation waiting to see what the answer is. So this, if I go math, enter, enter. It's 5 over 192. I, I'm not worried. We're not here to learn about how to convert decimals to fractions or to do it all in fractions. That's later when we need to. We can talk about those rules. So the answer is 5 over 192. So I, I know what happened there. You guys hit equal equals, and you saw that bizarre decimal, and you're going, eh, that doesn't seem right. All of our answers so far have been 50 or 640. All right, let's move on. There, this is just one more thing that we have to look at here. I'm going to write this out. Blank, blank, four, fifth, a fourth term, fifth term, sixth term, seventh term. I think there's got to be somebody in the room who knows how we can find the common ratio. This is not arithmetic. If it were arithmetic, I'm going to write something down that's not true in this question. If it were arithmetic, we would say that 4 plus 1, 2, 3, 4 common differences is equal to 64. This is what we would write if this is arithmetic because it's plus d, plus d, plus d, plus d. But it's not arithmetic, so it's not plus d. What is it we do to this third term? I'll even write it this way. What is it we do to it to get the seventh term? Do you know? Can you say that again? Six common ratios. It's not six, and we would never add them. We're going to be multiplying by a common ratio. The exponent is four. Right. We multiply by the common ratio to the exponent of four. Because what this is up here is r times r times r times r. Right? We're multiplying by the common ratio four times. And I suspect, or I hope, that many of you would know it's times r to the four by looking at these two numbers. That we don't necessarily have to write out blanks. Okay, well, the third term is four. So we get four r to the four equals 64. I can divide both sides of this by four. To get rid of that coefficient, and we get that. So as simple as it is to get an answer from here, you haven't been taught this before. So let me approach it from this standpoint. This is saying some number multiplied by itself, and I, f I made a mistake here. That's 16, right? Okay, 64 over 4 is 16. So we get r to the 4 equals 16. 
This is saying some number multiplied by itself four times gives you 16. I think you can figure out what that number is. Who's got it? Two. Two, two. two to the four is 16. Two times two times two times two. But if you don't see that, or it's not possible for you to find it, then you take the fourth root of 16. Which is an awkward thing on these graphing calculators. How many of you, by the way, have your calculator in classic mode where things look like that? So you guys are all math print modes where it looks like this. No? Some of you, 50-50. Okay. So if I want to find the fourth root of 16, this is what I do. I enter 4. It's not going to look right in either way, in either formula or calculator. I go to my math menu, and I choose this, which is the xth root. That does not look anything like what I'm talking about. And I enter 16. It's 2, 4 through 16. If I do that here... It's, it's, you know, it's better, but when you write the 4 through to 16, you should be tucking that 4 way, way down there. So are we okay with getting 2? Okay, what are we asked to find? We are asked to find 4th, 5th, and 6th terms. In other words, we're asked to find these missing terms in between. Well, if r is 2, I double, I double, I double. And for good measure, I double to make sure I get 64, and I do. One final example. Ah, oh, we can skip it. You get the idea. Well, no, this is, uh, yeah, we can skip it. I'm going to write one thing down for this. We would take negative 5 and multiply by the common ratio cubed to get negative 1 over 25. I guess we can do this quickly. Why am I multiplying by r cubed? Because to go from the 6th to the ninth term, that's three kind of leaps. So I need to take this number in yellow and divide by this number and then take the cube root. And I could explain the rules for doing that, but let's just do it on our calculator. If you're unsure, putting a set of brackets is never a bad thing. I don't think we need a set of brackets here. This is what we get. I need to take the cube root. Cube root is a special case. You don't need to enter the 3. There's a special function for the cube root. Point 0.2. If you want the seventh term, take negative 5 times point 0.2. This is the second term, the seventh term. If you want the eighth term, you multiply the seventh term by point 0.2, negative point 0.2. That's it. One of the reasons why geometric is easier is you don't, you haven't been taught the math for rearranging these exponential equations. So most of the work is just done on your calculator. By my count, and they keep switching the bell schedule, it was synced up with my back clock yesterday, and now it's synced up with my computer, or it was this morning. You have about 10 minutes to try a few of these. Tomorrow we're going to just get some more practice with geometric uh, sequences, and then we'll move on to geometric series. On Friday and on Monday, we'll finish the unit by looking at the final topic. So your unit exam will be split between Thursday and Friday of next week. You'll write part of it on Thursday and part of it on Friday. So get to work, please. I know I didn't leave you a lot of time, but get a few questions done. <laughs>